Hi everyone, I'm Tammy Haddad here with Victoria Espinel. Put your phones down, because she's the guru. Let's hear it for Victoria. Okay, somebody left this. Is this a hint? Are these questions I'm supposed to ask? All right, I'll just leave it over here. Uh, thank you so much uh, for being with us. We've heard so many amazing things, but uh, you can put your phones back on because you're going to want to write down everything she says. Victoria was the first, the nation's first, uh, chief uh, intellectual property uh, enforcement office. Were you an officer or coordinator. coordinator? Coordinator. No officer is in the Obama administration. And she runs BSA, the Software Alliance. She is talking to world leaders. She's talking to the greatest scientists, the greatest companies about what's going on. It's a privilege to be here with you. And I have to ask you first, we're talking about artificial intelligence, obviously, but can we just back it up and talk about what is happening, who is doing it, and how they're doing it. That's great. So thanks, thanks Tammy, um, and thanks to everyone for being here today. So artificial intelligence, at its essence, is built on data, on lots and lots of, of data, um, on much more data than human beings can process themselves. Although, I know, you, you can process a lot of data, Tammy, but more, more data than most human beings can process. And so when people talk about artificial intelligence and when they talk about how to build it and train it correctly, a lot of what they're talking about is uh, what that means is how do you make sure that the information, the data that is being used to build or create or train the artificial intelligence is as good as it possibly can be? How can you make sure that it's as accurate and complete as it can be? Because if the data that is used to train the artificial intelligence is incomplete in some way, then the output is going to be skewed. So when people talk about bias in artificial intelligence, really what they're talking about is how do you try to make sure that the information and the data that is being used to train the artificial intelligence is as good as it possibly can be. And there's a few different, there's a few different things, in my opinion, that need to happen in order to make sure that happens. But really, bias, eliminating bias in artificial intelligence is about trying to make sure that the data that goes into it is as good as it possibly can be. So is that, is that people? Is that, is that code? I mean, is there a code of ethics? How do you do it? So there's not yet a code of ethics. That is something that a lot of companies, uh, in, including software.org companies, are talking about. But I think it's a few things. So part of it is people. Part of it is making sure that the data scientists inside the companies are as trained as as well as they possibly can be. Well, who trains them? And, and, but a big part of it, I think a, probably a bigger issue is trying to make sure that the information is as good as it can be. And in my mind, that there's, there's, there's at least two different components of that. One is trying to have as much information as possible. So part of that is, for example, trying to get the government to share all the information that it has um, with companies that are that can use it in order to make sure that what they're building is as good as possible. Another part of it is trying to make sure that those that are training the AI themselves have a diversity of backgrounds and experiences. So something I feel very strongly about is you have you know, software is disrupting the world, artificial intelligence is disrupting the world, and when it's being developed, created, built, trained, whatever word you want to use, there ha the people at the table have to have a wide range of experiences and perspectives in order for it to be as good as it possibly can be. But and we, that is something that where we need to do more work. So that's my question. How do you do that work? We already know there's STEM programs, there's a variety. How do you get more diversity? Because that's really what you're talking about. More diversity of opinion, experience. How do you get that into the program? Well, we all know, right? We all agree there needs to be more diversity. Do we agree? Okay, so how, how can you do that? I mean, how, because you're talking about taking this entire industry, all of the, the companies, governments, everyone around the world together are trying to design. They're making these decisions, right? So how do you add that in, in advance? So I don't think there's, there's so, like anything that's complicated, there's not gonna be a single answer, but here are a few ideas. One is, I think it's really important that governments, and I would include in that the United States government, be rethinking the educational system to make sure that at a young age, children are being exposed to coding, computer science, as early as possible. And that won't just help get more girls uh, into coding, which is part of the issue that we have, but it will also, I think, help ensure that we have 
the promise of economic opportunity coming from this spread out across the United States. So, you know, my dream would be that any young person, regardless of where they live in the United States, have it is a feasible future for them to go into this area if they want to be. And that is not the reality today. So part of it is part of it is focusing on gender, but part of it I think is very much focusing on making sure that anywhere that you sit in the United States, this is an opportunity that you have. And, and there's a lot of work to be done there. And so I think government has a big role to play in terms of educational curriculums. You know, the, the industry, the, the tech industry and the software industry has already been doing a lot in terms of programs that, that we're supporting. Um, and that's great and that will continue and we will be doing even more. But I also don't think it should be, and it's not good for society for it to be kind of on the tech industry alone. So I think it needs to be the tech industry and the government trying to work together. Well, that's funny because one of the issues in the large picture of the culture today is that people are looking at their company that they work for, whether it's GE or Under Armour or you name it, to help them, ad to advance them. You should be giving me more job opportunities. Uh, my success is going through, I call it the daddy CEO situation, but it's it's actually double in a AI, right? Right, and, and just to divert for a moment, I think one thing that's really important is that when we in software industry are talking about training people for new jobs, we are not necessarily talking about training them to get jobs at software companies. I mean, that happens too, but what, what the... <laughs> But more what we're talking about is training people to get jobs that use tech skills or digital skills, either in the company that they are in or the company that they want to join, regardless of what sector that is. Every sector out there is using software today. And so the training that we are giving people will help them get jobs across industry sectors, not just in ours. Well, that's why I want to go back to the economic opportunity and the application of all this. So you've done it. You've got more of a diverse workforce. You've got more buys. How will all of this be implemented at companies all across the, the world. So uh, companies right now are hungry for people with these skills. I think an, an issue that we need to figure out though is we have, we have employer demand and we have people that are eager to get these skills. What we don't have yet, and hopefully this is something where software and tech can help, is a great matching of those. So where, employee, where employers need people and where there are people that have those skills and want those jobs, how do we make sure that they are coming together? And a, and a part of that also is thinking about whether or not, uh, and again, I think software can be really helpful here, can we, can we spread out those job opportunities across the United States? One of the things that software lets you do is work from anywhere. And that, we haven't really exploited yet the opportunities that that could bring workers to try to get access to jobs either in tech companies or in other types of companies, wherever they are. In other words, bring the, bring the jobs to the people rather than making people go to the jobs. Is that a gift of AI? I think that is a gift of software generally, um, but I think artificial intelligence is one of the areas where that is one of the um, benefits that artificial intelligence could bring. And is there a program that you see right now that's looking in any of the companies or governments, maybe when you were in the Obama administration, that are looking at bias this closely and trying to come up with solutions? So, so, so yes, there are definitely people that are looking at it. They're, the companies that, that we work with are looking at it intensely. Um, but here's because I know we don't have that much time. Here's, a, here's another element of this Two that I minutes. want to talk to. So we've <laughs> talked a lot, and, and we will continue to talk, and we should, about how you train artificial intelligence to make sure that it is unbiased. And that is something that absolutely that? has to happen. And part of that is about making sure that the information that goes into it is as complete and as accurate and reflects the diversity of experiences. But that's about creating artificial intelligence. I think what we also need to be thinking and talking about it, I hear less discussion is, okay, now it's been created. How do you use it in a way that eliminates bias? And how do you use artificial intelligence in a way that broadens inclusion? So I'm gonna give one example that, uh, that is, I think is really tremendous, but this is just an example. Um, and, and there's so many it's hard to pick. So now, now I'm upset at myself that I limited myself to one. But just to give one, um, there, uh, there are companies that are work using artificial intelligence to help uh, people uh, with autism who are not as good as recognizing facial cues as others to be able to use artificial intelligence so that when they are interacting, they are getting a correct interpretation of the, of the emotions of the person they are speaking to. 
And if that can happen in a way that is seamless, it will transform uh, people with autism or Asperger's ability to interact in the world. It will, for one thing, will open up career opportunities to them that don't exist today, but even just in their daily life and their interactions and their, um, with their friends and their families and their relationships, it will, it will change their lives in a way that will be so fundamental. And that is one example of a way that artificial That's intelligence could be used to, to broaden inclusion. Well, the other thing is that totally changes the workforce. Completely right? changes because the workforce. Because you're now bringing intelligent people from another part of society right into the middle of things. Um, so just if we, one yeah, more one example. One more minute, they're not going to come out for All right, one, minute. one more Go example ahead. really quickly that is it's even more directly related to workforces. Companies right now are using artificial intelligence to rethink their hiring strategies, including how they advertise for their jobs, to make sure that the way that they are seeking em employees doesn't have some sort of hidden bias, that they themselves may be entirely unaware that the way that they are advertising for jobs and the way that they are seeking for, that the way they are seeking employees has a bias in it that is skewing it to be uh, more attractive or appealing to certain types of people. So they're using artificial intelligence right now to look at their hiring practices and try to ferret out of them any unhidden bias that might be in there. And there, that is, I think, another area that is really exciting. That is, all of these things are nascent. You know, they're not, um, they are either only just starting to be deployed or not even being deployed yet. And I think we, this is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the applications of artificial intelligence to reduce bias. So part of the, the fundamental is we need to build it in a way that is unbiased, but then we need to use it in a way that will reduce bias. Thank you so much, Victoria Espinel. Terrific job. Now I'm gonna hand it back to the Washington Post. Thank you so much.